EPS Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm Mark Blunden and this is The Leader. It's the final furlong in the two-horse race to become the UK's next Conservative Prime Minister, with the winner set to be announced on Monday, after a summer's worth of hustings, spinning briefing and some weapons-grade obfuscation at times. Soon we'll know who will be the next to live at 10 Downing Street. We've had Ready for Rishi and Liz for Leader. We are not going to succeed as a country without a successful London. This is the greatest city on earth. Sadiq Khan failing, as always, to deliver affordable housing. But there's things we can do. We can densify in our urban areas in a way that is beautiful, like European cities. Liz Truss is the favourite, but Rishi Sunak's allies say it's still close in the race to succeed Boris Johnson. The final two made their last leadership pitches to Conservative members at leadership hustings at Wembley Arena on Wednesday, with the debate dominated by the rising cost of living. As a nation awaits its future figurehead, what challenges lie ahead and how will the winner be received by Red Wall voters and world leaders? To analyse the latest developments in the race for PM, we're joined by the Evening Standard's political editor Nick Cecil and Dr Jeevan Sander, an economist and political scientist at King's College London. But first, Nick, there was a bit of a ruckus in the Commons on Friday. So it looks like some Extinction Rebellion protesters have managed to get into the Commons chamber, which is a good stunt, but actually kind of, there are no or very few MPs at Westminster at the moment. They'll be long gone by the time uh, the, the Commons returns next week. So on to the next PM. Could you give us a recap on how we've got to where we are now? First of all, the MPs whittled down a list of contenders down to two. That, that was uh, at the end of July. They, they finished that process and that was Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak that has now that shortlist has gone out to the wider Tory membership which is some maybe 160,000 180,000 members and now they're voting uh, they've been voting throughout the summer on who they want to be the next Tory leader and prime minister and voting ends at 5 p.m today um, Friday the 2nd. Then the big reveal on Monday. There will be a big reveal uh, shortly after midday on Monday we'll get the name of the winner. Polls suggest it will be Liz Truss, but polls can be wrong. So we have to wait to see who it will be. And then on the Tuesday, Boris Johnson and whoever wins, they will fly up to Scotland to go to see the Queen at Balmoral. This process, uh, change of prime minister, would normally take place at Buckingham Palace. But the Queen, uh, because of concerns over her mobility, she is going to stay in Scotland. And uh, Boris and um, the next prime minister will have to jump on the plane. What's the biggest challenge for the winner on day one. Both of them face a, a big challenge in restoring trust in politics. Obviously, the last three years have seen a lot, lot of controversies, um, including the number 10 party gate scandal. So there's a, an issue of trust in politics. And also, they'll have to basically f- find extra billions to help families and um, how many households, uh, as well as uh, many businesses, get through this winter w- with hugely higher energy bills than in previous years. So far, neither of the candidates have seemed to have outlined sufficiently strong plans to, to help many families cope. Do you think the Conservatives will hold on to those Red Wall seats without Boris Johnson's unique pulling power? Boris had a certain X factor. Obviously, there was a lot of controversy during his premiership, but he still retained that X factor amongst many voters. And that will be very hard to emulate uh, by either Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak. The Conservatives are around 10 points behind in the polls at the moment. New prime ministers, new leaders normally get a bit of a bounce. We'll have to wait to see whether Mr. Truss or Mr. Sunak enjoy that. But either way, they, are, they face a tough task ahead. Um, and some Tories are already having sellers' regret in getting rid of Boris Johnson. Anyone on that earlier long list to keep an eye on as a future star? Certainly, Kemi Badenoch, the former Equality Minister, she made uh, an impact. She uh, came to, to national prominence with her campaign. So, so certainly a, a lot of Conservatives see her as a, as a future star. Penny Morden, her star rose very sharply, but then she failed to keep that momentum going. And Tom Tugendhat also performed better than expected. And what about this chatter about a Johnson comeback? Yes, well, it, he is still very popular amongst Tory members. And certainly if Mr. 
Liz Truss or Mr Sunak or one of them will become Prime Minister, they will face a massive challenge in dealing with the cost of living crisis and things could go very badly wrong for them. You know, there's also an NHS crisis as well. So that new Prime Minister will face a hugely challenging time if they flop and it all goes wrong. Mr Johnson could be waiting in the rings uh, for, for return. And certainly by then in a year's time, the Partygate scandal will be more, more, more in the past. Um, controversies of, over COVID and lockdown will also be a bit more historic. Wouldn't rule out a boy's comeback. Let's go to the ads. Coming up, we're with Dr Jeevan Sander, an economist and a political scientist at King's College London. Will the candidates' economic policy stand up to scrutiny? And who will Labour prefer to battle at the dispatch box? Why not hit rate and follow in the meantime? Now we're joined by Dr. Sander, an economist and political scientist at King's. Jeevan, what's your take on how the voting's looking? Yeah, I mean, it's well over 90% for trust to win. I mean, never say never for Sunak, but this polling risk would be absolutely massive if Sunak was to have a chance of multiple polling companies. I mean, to give you an idea of context, you know, when Donald Trump had his surprise win in 2016, the polls were out by about seven to 10 points in some states. Sunak is currently losing by over 20. So it's incredibly likely that Truss is going to win come Monday. Why do you think Truss has managed to connect with the party faithful in a way that Sunak has struggled to? Well, I think because Truss had a clear message and Sunak didn't is one of the key reasons. So Truss's clear message, by the way, was to tell the Conservative Party what they wanted to hear. You know, there was the fairy tale economics, massive tax cuts will solve everything. We don't have to worry about our relationships with the European Union and match with that this kind of toddler politics that says every single time something goes wrong, it's someone else's fault. It's the Remainers, it's the woke mobs, it's the European Union. But that's what the Conservative Party wants to hear. And that's what we've got with this trust. Fairy tale economics meets toddler politics. That's been her message. That's how, unfortunately, she's likely to govern. For Sunak, his messaging was just all over the place. You know, he started off saying, I'm the grown up in the room. I'm going to give it to you straight. No tax cuts. Within three days, promising more tax cuts. Sunak knows the Rwanda plan cannot work. Saw Truss go for it and said, actually, I'm going to go for the Rwanda plan as well. And the thing is, he can't out-trust Truss. You know, once he starts trying to play on that line, he starts to lose. And the final thing, of course, the most pro-Boris section of society is the Conservative Party membership. Truss was studiously loyal. And Sunak, of course, was the one who resigned to help kind of bring down his downfall. And what about their economics? And Sunak at least had an understanding that you had to give money out to those people who weren't earning. You know, pensioners, disabled, children in single parent households. You had to give them money in order to ensure they could survive the winter. Truss just keeps pushing this line of tax cuts, tax cuts, tax cuts. But that does nothing for those at the bottom. Both their tax cuts were incredibly regressive, giving the most money to the richest people in this country. Truss, who looked is the most likely to be prime minister. I mean, her tax cuts are going to be incredibly expensive and they'll give the average family about £400. That's not going to help when energy bills are going to be over £2,000 higher this winter. It's not going to help when half of us are already struggling to pay our energy bills at the moment. It's certainly not well placed to hit the cost of living crisis. And on the other side, Sunak, I mean, just never seemed to kind of see the scale of the challenge ahead. And finally, both of them haven't really seen the point of even if we have help for energy bills this winter, how are we going to get energy bills down in the future? And really, it's about home insulation, a massive expansion of renewables. And neither of them have proposed that, either Sunak while in office or Truss at the moment during this contest. How on earth can Truss promise 20,000 more police officers while cutting taxes? It does work in the sense that you can borrow more to achieve these things. You can borrow more to achieve tax cuts. The United Kingdom doesn't have a, a financing problem. But the question is, is that borrowing worth it? Is it a good investment for the UK? And actually, the return on tax cuts, basically giving the rich loads of money, which is what her tax cuts would mean, will do nothing to help this country grow in the long run. You know, If you're going to borrow money, you need to be ensuring that actually you're investing in this nation's productive capacities in this future. You know, Actually levelling up, ensuring childcare is decent, ensuring kids can eat because obviously hungry kids don't learn well and 2.6 million kids are going hungry at the moment. So look, you can borrow to fund these tax cuts, which is certainly where she seems to be going and what her advisors want her to do. But that will not help the British public today and it won't help them in the future either. How do you think Liz Truss will be viewed on the world stage? 
She'll certainly be seen as incredibly hawkish. You know, Truss has always played to a, a singular gallery. That gallery is the Conservative Party membership. The Conservative Party membership wants a strong support for Ukraine. She will absolutely go in behind where Boris Johnson has. I'm expecting her to visit Kyiv very soon after taking office. More broadly then, you know, she will provide the help that's needed there. The real problem with her foreign policy side certainly will be our relationships with the European Union. We are already suffering from falls of investment, higher prices than we need to because we haven't got Brexit done and businesses can't invest because they're not sure about the future. It's more expensive to get goods here because of all the checks. She now wants to have another fight with the European Union. That's going to cost British families. And so that's the real worry on the foreign policy side. Yes, an absolute hawk when it comes to Ukraine but an inability to work with what is and will remain our largest economic trading partner. And who do you think his Starmer will prefer to joust with at the dispatch box? Starmer would probably prefer to face Truss across the dispatch box. You know, Truss panders in the same way that Boris Johnson does, but it's absolutely kind of none of his charisma and his ability or his ability to kind of think on his feet and sometimes just, you know, deny the reality of, of the situation in front of him with complete chutzpah. Um, I think Starmer would prefer to face Truss and will, you know, take him down. And I think Sunak as well, though, he would not have certainly minded either. You know, Johnson at least had the, an ability to kind of distract from the question at hand, you know, with his kind of verbal flourishes. And in, in a sense, actually kind of, you know, winking at the emptiness of his own answers. Neither Trust nor Sunak would be able to do that. And I think actually Stan would feel confident in taking them both on. And finally, thanks very much for your time. What are your thoughts on the other candidates who were on the long list? Perhaps those who seem to have a bit more of a wider voter appeal. Perhaps maybe Tom Tushenhart seemed a bit more centrist. I mean, the problem with these two Conservative leadership candidates who have faced, and in fact, all of them, was the unsquareable circle. And the unsquareable circle is the Conservative Party memberships want lower taxes and often quite lower spending. And the British public want higher spending and higher taxes on the rich. And so what wins you the Conservative Party leadership makes it impossible to govern afterwards. I think every single candidate faced that problem and every single one didn't really find a way to deal with it in a convincing manner. And I actually think also more broadly, you know, we should remember this is a Conservative Party after Boris Johnson that expelled 21 Conservative MPs for voting against the Brexit deal they knew would damage this country. And so they've all kind of bought into this idea, bought into this project, and bought into the denial of reality. And that's where the Conservative Party is today, unfortunately. And that's why the, the kind of leadership pool was seemed to be so wide and yet oh so shallow when we came down to it. There's more on this story in the Evening Standard newspaper and online at standard.co.uk. That's The Leader. We're back on Monday at 4pm.